We're at the top of the hour, let's get started. I'm gonna um, share my screen really quickly. Before I do that, I wanted to do um, some quick introductions. Um, I'll start and then I'll maybe just go around and whoever's on my screen call, call you out. Um, so if you can introduce yourself, where you're from, what program you're from, um, and we'll get started. Um, so first, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we are going to be talking about the National Council on Administrative Fellowships today and what it means to be a graduate program who's a part of our um, organization. So I'm very excited to talk to all of you. Um, I'm Natasha Kassam. Um, so I am one of the program managers here at the National Center for Healthcare Leadership. And the Council on Administrative Fellowships is just one of our programs um, that we have. And when I introduce Leanne in a little bit, she'll go through some of our other things as well. Um, and then I'm not going to be the only one speaking today. I've got um, a few folks here from other graduate programs who are going to talk about their experience and be able to help answer all your questions as well. So um, I will pass it off to Sue first um, to introduce herself and then we'll go around and introduce everyone else. Hi, I'm Sue Boren and I'm a professor and program director of our MHA program at the University of Missouri. Perfect, thank you, Sue. Uh, Walter, do you wanna go next? Sure. Um, first of all, I didn't realize, I should have realized it, that this was an NCHCL program. I first uh, hooked up with your organization when I was a, a part of North Shore LIJ, uh, or now Northwell Health. And uh, I was there when we won the quality award for network, I think it was back in 2010. Uh, that was in Baltimore of all places. Um, I'm Walter Markowitz. I am uh, an assistant professor at Hofstra University. As I mentioned before, we're very proudly just received uh, CAMI accreditation and uh, I'll be uh, working on uh, establishing, let's call it an enhanced um, uh, educational program for our graduating seniors about going into fellowship programs. Perfect, thank you, Walter. Um, Michelle, do you wanna go next? Sure, uh, Michelle McGowan. I am an associate professor and program director of the MHA program at King's College in Wilkesbury, Pennsylvania. We're housed in the business school, so we are AACSB accredited. Um, next up, I have Dr. Weaver on my screen. Hi, everyone. I'm Gillette Weaver, and I'm the um, division director uh, over the healthcare management program at Florida A&M University. And our MHA program recently, as in last November, became CAMI accredited. Same time as we did. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, I have Brian on the screen next. I'm Brian Nickerson. I'm the MHA director here at the Icon School of Medicine in New York City. Thank you, Brian. Julie, is that you? <laughs> Hi, Walter. How are you? Julie used to be my boss. <laughs> <laughs> and you mine. And you mine before that. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. It's true. Julie, do you want to go next? Yeah, maybe I'll go next. Uh, Julie Agris, I'm happy to be here from Stony Brook Medicine. We have two newly CAMI accredited programs, one uh, an MHA and the other an MPH with a health policy and management concentration. Thrilled to be here. And my colleague, uh, Krista Gottlieb's here as well, so it might make sense for her to go next. Perfect, Krista. Good. Good afternoon, everyone. Apologies, I can't have my camera on at the moment, but I work closely with um, Julie and our faculty for our MHA and Health Policy and Management Concentration programs. So looking forward to learning from you all today. Perfect. Thank you so much, Krista. And then um, last but not least, I've got Leanne. Hi, everyone. I'm Leanne Swanson. I'm the CEO of the National Center for Healthcare Leadership and happy to be with you today. And thank you all so much for spending some time with us. Perfect. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so we can all take a look and see what we're going to be talking about today. Um, so um, so on the agenda, we've done the intros already, so that's great. Um, I'm going to pass it on to Leanne in just a, a minute to talk a little bit about the National Center for Healthcare Leadership, which hosts 
um, our three premier programs and the Council of Administrative Fellowships is one of them. And then I'll go into a little bit about um, what the council is, what we do, um, our code of good practice, membership benefits and administrative fellowship trends. And then I'm gonna pass it on to um, Juliette and Sue from Florida A&M and University of Missouri to talk about their experience being members and help answer any questions um, you may have. And then you know we'll open it up for Q&A, but feel free to chat questions in the Q&A as well. I'll be monitoring that um, as well, you know, if you don't want to wait till the end. So, um, yeah. All right. Thanks, Natasha. So, yeah, I'll just share a little bit about NCHL, the National Center for Healthcare Leadership. Um, Walter, it sounds like you know a little bit, but um, for those that may not be familiar, we actually are a nonprofit organization that was actually, we're um, celebrating our 20th year this year. So we were founded back in 2001. And really, um, I didn't mention this during our uh, webinar yesterday that we had with our fellowship sites, but we were founded as a result of uh, a national study that found that there were a lot of opportunities for improvement, if you will, in the area of healthcare leadership. Um, specifically, one area was around building the talent pipeline for healthcare leaders. And so um, hence NCHL was formed and we have um, really are founded upon our principles of evidence-based learning and practices in the area of leadership and organizational excellence. And we have a new mission statement that we rolled out just this year. Um, and it's, it's in the first bullet there where we are dedicated to advancing healthcare leadership and organizational excellence by building diverse, inclusive, and collaborative relationships in the US and abroad. And let me tell you a little bit about our three premier programs and how they relate back to our mission and work. Uh, of course, Natasha is going to talk about the National Council on Administrative Fellowships, but again, that's the that's the piece of one of our premier programs where you all are here to learn more and, and what you all are doing in the area to, to grow the talent pipeline to, I call them emerging healthcare leaders, right? It's our next generation of leaders uh, across for hospitals and health systems in the US. Uh, we have two other premier programs. One is our leadership excellence networks. And again, this is a collaborative of US hospitals and health systems that primarily focus on the work of dedicating and strengthening leadership development, talent management, um, physician leadership, organizational excellence. So we have a variety of councils that meet um, in the area of diversity and inclusion, leadership development. We just started a new well-being council this year as part of the LENS program. Uh, and, and the other premier program that we have is our U.S. Cooperative of International Patient Programs. And this, this is a membership-based program, as well, a program membership-based uh, uh, collaborative or consor consortium, if you will, of leading academic medical centers, hospitals, health systems who work and serve international patients. Uh, and hence why our mission also includes the U.S. and abroad, because the work of, it's called USKIP is the, the acronym, uh, is really focused on education for these international patient programs, but also um, market, international market research, peer collaboration, um, benchmarking, and, and inter-organizational collaboration with not only the hospitals that serve international patients, but foreign governments and foreign um, corporations as well. And so the purpose of, of today's webinar, obviously, is to let you know a little bit more about NCAP and, and the work that we do, again, to build the talent pipeline. But again, we do all of this. All of our premier programs really focus on several different key activities, which is education, peer-to-peer -peer collaboration. We have a, a wide array of hospitals and health systems from across the country who participate in these, these programs. And really one of the key outcomes of, of that is the peer-to-peer -peer collaboration and sharing of best practices across, across the continuum to help to have, help have us help our members achieve their 
uh, business goals and mission and work. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Natasha so we can dive deep into the MCAP program and all of the great offerings that, that we have to offer. Perfect, thank you, Leanne. Um, so uh, a little bit about NCAP. Um, it's one of the newer sort of councils that we have with NCHL. And it essentially started, I think the conversation started around like 2012, 2013, when um, graduate programs and fellowship sites, so mainly hospitals and health systems kind of came to the table and they said, hey, we love administrative fellowships. It's a great opportunity for students to um, get a head start and kind of get on the leadership track and to really learn um, a lot as well as have some great um, mentors, but there's no sort of practice around it. Students are coming into their graduate program and very quickly having to decide if they want to go down a fellowship track, you know, where they want to go and start applying because all these organizations have different deadlines and it was, it's very competitive and, you know, there was um, sites that were undercutting each other because everyone wanted the same, you know, top 10 students or whatnot, even though there's thousands of really great quality students out there. And then there were students who didn't even know about fellowships until the end when they were graduating. And by that point, it was too late. So that's kind of how NCAF got started. We came together and we decided, um, you know, we're gonna kind of help bridge this gap between practice and academia. Um, the folks who are bringing in this great talent and um, uh, the employers who are going to be hiring them and really make it a standard coordinated practice. So. Um, in 2015, NCAP was launched, and the first thing that we did was really standardize some of these administrative fellowship dates when it comes to the recruitment process. Um, and we created a uniform practice around it. And then in 2016, we launched the centralized application service, very similar to when um, students are applying to graduate program with like HAMCAS or SOCAS. Um, we launched NAFCAS, which is just for administrative fellowships. And that allowed students to get um, sort of a very clear and direct route into the fellowship world where they can see all of the organizations that are potentially recruiting, what the culture of that organization looks like, what that fellowship program looks like, and um, really have the ability to have a one-stop shop to apply to multiple fellowships at the same time. On the flip side, for hospitals and health systems, this gave them a pool of national talent across the country um, of young leaders that could potentially come into their organization and grow there um, and be able to bring in um, students that they may have not previously recruited because um, they're just, you know, it, their visibility wasn't that large. So um, right now we're made up of 119 members, which is very exciting. Um, and all of our members, we consist of hospitals and health systems and graduate programs, um, all follow the same sort of code of good practice where um, they let their students know, here are the, the dates um, of recruitment, here are what your responsibilities are as a student, here's what your you know, fellowship site's responsibility is, and they really advocate to make this sort of a fair practice. Um, and I'm going to go into the code of good practice really quickly, but before I do that, I wanted to pause and see if um, Juliet or Sue had anything to add um, in terms of the background of NCAF before we sort of move on. Good. Yeah. I'll, I just um, to to reinforce what you said about students starting early. That was a huge. Uh, key for us is that we needed students to, from the minute they start our program, be aware of fellowships, be aware of how to apply for fellowships, be aware of the requirements, you know, who gets chosen, what types of, um, at what, you know, we know that everybody needs a, a high GPA, but what does academic performance mean? And to be thinking about that the minute they start our program. In the past, we were kind of letting students wait until they hit their final um, semester and, and they're thinking about internships and then they would start thinking about fellowships. And what we discovered is that was just simply too late. So we needed to reform our process to really put fellowships on the forefront and um, NCAF has really allowed us to provide a structured uh, resource for the students. And, and I don't wanna go too far into, into everything, but um, very, very structured, very, very helpful it's easier for the students rather than them going to you know 20 different hospital websites to, to see what fellowships are available. 
on those sites, they can now go to one site and find uh, not just information about fellowships, but I, I got to mention information on professional development as well. And that's a wonderful resource that we get from um, um, from NCAH. I'm going to mess up the acronym. There's so many acronyms. We have but, a lot of acronyms. <laughs> <laughs> so um, thank you for that. No, I 100% agree. And I'll give you an opportunity at the end to kind of talk about that professional development aspect too. Um, because I don't think I included that in any of our slides, but I think that's a good thing to touch on. Um, so the code of good practice essentially is something um, that all of our members, graduate programs and fellowship sites follow. And it, it lists out the basic responsibilities of what a fellowship site will do when they're recruiting. So they'll abide by these dates. They'll make sure to, you know, not, uh, they'll allow your students to place an offer on hold so they can continue interviewing elsewhere. Um, but on the flip side, it has some student responsibilities as well of, you know, the student will behave professionally. If they accept an offer elsewhere, they'll let the other, other sites know. Um, and then for graduate programs, just encouraging students to, you know, apply to, uh, apply to sites where they really see a future. Um, we'll talk about how competitive the market is in just a little bit, but, um, you know, just making sure if, you know, they don't want to move to rural Iowa, maybe don't apply for a fellowship over there and apply for a fellowship where they really see themselves um, growing and, you know, staying there. Our data has found um, that 60% of all fellows stay with that organization five years later and are in a leadership role. Um, and some other data that we found shows that 86% um, of graduate students who go into a fellowship role um, they end up going into a management role right after that fellowship is over. So whether it's a 12 month fellowship or 24 month fellowship, um, the large majority of these fellows are going into management level roles directly after with that organization and then staying there at least, you know, for the beginning and early stages of their career. Um, so with that being said, um, the code of good practice is very important because this is kind of what um, your students need to know when it comes to applying um, to these fellowships. So the, uh, the application period for the first cycle runs from mid-June to early October. Um, now with NCAF, 80% of the fellowship sites on there are, are, are members of NCAF and they're using the centralized application service, but there are still a lot of, you know, 20% of sites that are um, kind of go, doing their own thing and they'll be recruiting in the same time period. So they won't have these standardized dates so that's something just to keep in mind, but anyone who's an NCAF will have these same dates and they can't tell your students otherwise. So if someone was interested in Cleveland Clinic um, and I'm just picking on them, this never happened, but let's say Cleveland Clinic was like, oh, our deadline September 29th. Well, guess what? That's incorrect because they're a member and they have to abide by um, this date. So just general um, recruitment happens um, between mid-June and October. Um, and that's the application period. The application deadline is October 1st. So if your students meet this deadline or are able to submit a completed application by 11.59 p.m. Eastern, then they will be considered for whatever fellowships um, they apply to. Um, and a completed application includes, um, you know, uh, three letters of recommendation, um, graduate school transcripts, and anything else a fellowship site might require. So some say, some want like a cover letter and a resume, some want short answer questions, um, some want a writing sample. So each site is a little bit different, but there are some extra things they can add in there um, to really make sure they're getting the candidates that they want. Um, so as long as all of those things are submitted by October 1st, then the student will be considered for that particular fellowship role. Um, Anytime after the application closes, so starting October 2nd, fellowship sites um, can make offers. And this is specifically towards um, those that participate in NCAF. Now those sites can make an offer and they are not required to let your, you know, have your students uh, accept the offer right away. They can say, you're able to accept this, you're able to hold this, or you're able to decline it. So if a student puts an offer on hold, they're now able to hold that offer and interview elsewhere. And they have six weeks to potentially do this. They can only hold one an offer at a time because on the back end, let's say someone Cleveland Clinic makes a student an offer. And then, you know, um, two days later, um, Cone Health makes that student the same offer. 
uh, uh, then that student kind of has to pick which one am I going to decline and which one can I continue to hold. And I, I'm the only one that has that information on the back end or anyone at NCHL, so we can kind of monitor and see if students are holding multiple offers. But we haven't really had any issues with that. But the good thing is that all of these sites, um, all you know, 80 some sites are saying, we're gonna let your students hold an offer and not pressure them to make a, a decision right away um, so that they can follow through an interview with other places and make sure it's really a good fit um, because they wanna make sure it's a good fit for the student and the student has that transparency to make that decision as well as a good fit for them. Uh, the formal acceptance date is November 12th at noon. So by that point, if a student hasn't accepted an offer, the fellowship site can then move on to their second or third choice and extend an offer that way. And then um, any offers made after November 12th, sites are required to give at least 24 hours of um, uh, decision-making time. And then there is a second cycle. Um, a lot of MBA students fall into this or maybe um, folks that might have a different sort of um, timeline based on their school year. So that runs from uh, late November, November 22nd this year until the end of January. And that allows for students to have a second chance at um, applying for a fellowship. So maybe they didn't know about fellowships um, until, you know, September 15th. And it's like, I have 15 days to scramble and, you know, put this application. And if that's not enough time, then they can apply during the second cycle. Or let's say they didn't get a fellowship the first cycle, they can always apply the second cycle. Um, usually in that first June to October period, you have the large majority of sites recruiting. So on NAFCAS, we'll have about 75 sites or so, sometimes even more. Um, and in the second cycle, there'll probably only be, you know, anywhere from 10 to 15 sites. And so um, fewer sites in the second cycle, but still some opportunity there. Um, I'm gonna pause there and see if um, Sue or Juliet have anything to add or if anyone has any questions. I think I would just add, and maybe you've said uh, some of these things, uh, that this fellowship process is now so well organized that all of our students know about the fellowship uh, process, probably before we um, joined NAFCAS or before or, uh, NCAF or before NCAF existed, things were a little bit, um, you know, less organized, but now things are so well organized that all of our students know, and I've just finished discussions with our first year students reminding all of them that um, the, the portal opens in June and um, to start to get their applications ready. Okay, perfect. Um, so a little bit about, um, I'm gonna jump into a little bit about some of our members. So here's a full list of all of our members. It's small, but if you see someone on here that you'd like me to connect you with, um, let me know, I'd be happy to do that. Um, but uh, there are a lot of benefits um, that come with being, uh, having your graduate program be an NCAP. So first our organizational structure is very member led. We have the steering committee um, where it's made up of um, fellowship sites and graduate programs who kind of help determine our direction. So as things start popping up, we run things by steering and then ultimately they run it by the larger membership um, and we kind of make a decision. So one, a great example of this is um, when NCAF and the centralized dates um, first started, we used to have this offer acceptance date where all fellowship sites would make offers at the same day um, and students would have sort of 24 hours to make a decision and they could potentially get like three offers during 24, a 24 hour period and they would have to make that decision. Um, what we started noticing was that folks that were not an NCAP, those fellowship sites, if they knew that offers were gonna be made from these 80 organizations on November 12th, they would make their offers on no, uh, November 10th and say, you have six hours to make a decision. And then a student was placed in this sort of, you know, very uncomfortable position of, oh, do I take this offer or do I wait two days and see if I get any others, you know? and so. We, we changed that and now, you know, offers can be made anytime so students can accept whenever or they can place it on hold. Um, so that was something that came directly from our membership through steering and then kind of pass it on. So we have that to kind of guide us. And then we've got um, four subcommittees, which all of our members are welcome to participate on. So 
Um, we've got the benchmarking metrics and research subcommittees. So someone from your graduate program or you are really interested in kind of figuring out the data and the trends around um, fellowships, then this could be, you know, the committee for you to kind of do some project work that way. We have a long-term planning and special projects subcommittee, which this year will be working on a summer enrichment series for students. So it's a four week, um, four sessions, once a week, uh, summer program for students just to get professional development and some educational components around fellowships. So we'll have some guest speakers from some of the top programs in the country. We'll have you know, folks talking about interview prep and resume and things like that. So it's a great opportunity for students to learn, um, but also from a graduate program perspective, if you wanted some national leadership um, visibility, this could be a great place for um, you to get some of that. We have a membership and outreach subcommittee where, you know, we're really trying to figure out how to diversify NCAF's um, reach. And then we have a fellows education subcommittee, which actually exciting news. We just redid sort of the membership requirements for that subcommittee. And we're now allowing graduate students to be able to sit on that subcommittee, second year students who um, are going into a fellowship or interested in that to sit on that. And they lead like webinars and our virtual reading club and things like that. And it can really help them get some good public, public speaking um, practice as well as, you know, leadership level and different project building on a national level. So things that your faculty, staff, and students can participate in. Um, and then I think one of the most important things is the firsthand information that you, your graduate program will get for these students. Um, so all of our member sites, um, if they have an informational webinar going on or some sort of event for prospective fellows, we will get that information to you directly firsthand. And we have this document that we um, share every summer where um, th there's a full list of events that are going on in the entire summer. So if you have a student who's really like, oh, I wanna go to Houston Methodist, well, you just go onto their document and you're like, oh, well, they have this and this going on for you know prospective fellows. Why don't you go and attend? And that information will be readily available to you versus having to go look for it somewhere else with, and it may or may not be available. Um, we also provide you with any information around fellowship fairs and events. So, um, you know, in the past, NCHL and ACHE um, have partnered to do fellowship fairs together. We might be doing one virtually this year, um, but in the past they've been in person. So if there is a fellowship fair going on, we'll let you know. And even if it's not with us, um, I get different organizations telling me about fellowship things all the time. So I get that information out to the membership. Um, we have a document with interview dates. So all, we, encourage all of our members, our fellowship sites to let us know when those interviews are. And so as we get those dates in, we share that document with all of our graduate programs so they can let students know the plan accordingly. So maybe they're applying to two sites and they're like interviewing on the same day. That student's gonna have to make a very difficult decision to say, which one do I wanna go to more? Or the other good thing about sharing interview dates is a lot of our sites will collaborate with one another. So if they're in the same region, they might be getting that same applicant pool. So they'll work together to make sure their interviews don't overlap so that students can kind of ensure to attend all of them. So we share those dates. And then we have a document around summer internships, which um, is always hard because not everyone offers a summer internship. So if we know of a program that's offering it, we'll put it into this document and the students have this resource um, through you to access and um, you know find out all this information. So. I want to say one of the greatest membership benefits is this firsthand information that you get for your students. Um, along with that, uh, there are NAFCAS fee waivers that we give out to all of our graduate programs. Um, each program will receive two waivers. So um, the NAFCAS application fee is $25 for the first application and $32 for any application after that. Um, we have worked with liaison who kind of runs this cast to keep this cost low. I think we're the lowest, one of the lowest uh, fees out there when it comes to applying through a centralized application service and we're really trying hard to keep it that way. Um, and we know that sometimes uh, the financial aspect can be a barrier for students. So that's why we provide each of our graduate programs with two um, waivers that you can then provide to any student that you may um, see fit and they can use that to um, go ahead and apply. Um, we very rarely see a student applying to 20, 30, 40 sites. Most students will apply to six on average. And I, I think the next slide has some of those numbers, but um, you do get those fee waivers as well. Um, and then um, 
you know, I think I've touched on some of these other things. Uh, you're basically saying to your students, hey, we want you to be a part of um, taking you. We want you to take advantage of fellowships, but we also want you to make sure you're doing it in a fair way. And um, it's a standard way. And this is how folks are going to be recruiting. And people aren't taking advantage of your student by saying, hey, you have until September 29th to make this decision when, you know, technically they can have a lot longer and so you're you're standing by sort of that fair and quality recruitment practice and you get to network with all of these fellowship sites um, to touch base of base with them and you know um, really just you know if you're if you have one of our sites and they're in your local area and you're like hey Natasha I was wondering if this person could come talk to our students we can very easily make that happen for you um, and then we have um, some developmental opportunities for students too. Um, we have the summer enrichment series and we have an on the menu reading club as well as ton of benchmarking data. So if your graduate program needed some information, I can definitely um, get that for you. So I'm gonna pause there, see if anyone has any questions or if I missed anything um, that needs to be addressed before I kind of go into the numbers and then pass it on to Sue and Juliet for their experience. I do have a question. Yeah. And it's a question of, I call it sheer ignorance on my part. The, the, the question is, I, I don't really understand the, the, because I'm new to this, the process for if we wanted to have our program be a member, is, is there a, a process? I'm sure that there is. Um, will we be apprised of what that process is? Yes, so um, the NCAP membership is based by graduate program. And so it's an annual membership, which runs from June to December every year, or from July to June every year, depending on when you join in the year. So um, Walter, if you were gonna say to me today, hey, I think I wanna make my graduate program an NCAP member and take advantage of this, we would put you on that January cycle and your membership would run from January, 2021, December, 2021. Um, or if you said in you know July 1st, then we would put you on that July cycle. But basically it's an annual membership. It is $1,100 for the year. Mm -hmm. And that membership fee will include all of these benefits as well as any other opportunities that we have for your students. Um, you know, um, I reach out to the graduate programs all the time if I need, you know, if I'm looking for a student speaker or if I'm looking for a fellow at some different location or alumni, I tap into the graduate program to say, hey, which one of your alumni or current students would be a good fit for this and you know, get, get them involved that way too. So you get all kind of all of this information for that, that price. There is also a um, $350 one-time membership setup fee. Um, so that is something you pay when you first join in that first year, but after that, it's uh, not charged to you again. So that's a great question. Are you the one that we would contact to get, yeah. to get that done? Thank yeah. You. And what I'll do is I'm get, we re, we're recording this. So I'm going to send a follow-up email with the recording and the application link. So when you're interested, it's pretty basic. It'll ask you for um, your, a little bit about your program. Um, so we can make sure that we put that information into our directory so other you know, sites can search for you. And then we'll send you the code of good practice to sign. And then you're, you're kind of in. Um, so pretty easy. Um, so that's a great question. Uh, any other questions before I jump into the numbers of what the fellowship market looks like? Natasha, I think you might want to, uh, I think you might mention it here, but I'm only mentioning it because I know Walter and some others um, just mentioned how they are newly CAMI accredited sites. Yeah. And um, the majority, I think the majority of our graduate programs are CAMI accredited. Is that fair statement that the majority of them are? Yes, they actually all are um, yeah. because I think we uh, Florida a and just got their accreditation. So now they are all CAMI accredited. All of our graduate programs yeah. are. Um, and our membership and outreach committee is currently working on ways to bring in other accreditations as well. Um, what I will say is on the fellowship site, when sites are creating their page, um, there are, I want to say a lot of them, it's probably split 50-50 now, this last year definitely changed a lot of things, but in the past, when the centralized application first started, everyone on their page would say, student must be from a CAMI accredited program. 
Um, that is now changing where the large, I think 50% of um, sites are still saying students must be from Academy accredited programs. So that accreditation definitely helps. But then there are the other sort of 50% that are not, that have now completely taken that off and said, you know, student must be from an MHA or MPH or MBA background with a healthcare focus, and they can be accredited by um, various organizations and um, some list it, some don't. So there's definitely sort of that um, uh, change happening on the fellowship site end as well, because they want to make sure they're bringing in um, talent from across the country and they're removing some of those barriers. So while the large majority, um, uh, all of our graduate programs are CAMI accredited, um, fellowship sites are now kind of making that transition to where they want, can't, some want CAMI accredited and some are very open to, um, you know, where applicants can apply. One other question. Mm -hmm. my, my assumption is, is that students can still go through the, the NAFCAS application process even if they're not from a, um, I have to get you your abbreviation. From the NAFCAS, yeah. Right, right. because yeah. I, I, I've signed quite a number of recommendations for students mm -hmm. in the past. Yes, students can absolutely um, go through and apply through NAFCAS, even if your graduate program is not a part of our membership. Um, the benefit of being a part of it is that, you know, you're getting sort of that firsthand information that we don't give to all of our, all the graduate programs and um, just, you know, letting your students know that you align with all of these great programs that are there to make sure that they have a very fair and transparent recruitment process versus some organizations that might pressure them to make a decision one way or the other before sort of weighing out all their options. So, um, your students are more, even if your program's not there, your students are able to um, apply. Perfect. All right, so I will jump in to uh, the numbers. So um, this is some trend data that we've collected over the years. And um, I'm sure if you're looking at 2019 to 2020, there is a drastic decline 65% across the country um, in terms of the number of fellowships available. Um, when the pandemic first started, I think because fellowships are entry level roles, essentially, those programs were sort of the first to go. And it was a tough decision that I think a lot of organizations had to make. Um, so we saw you know, a really big decline. The number of students graduating or looking at fellowships didn't change, it probably only went up but the number of roles available definitely declined. Um, but all of our fellowship sites, 85% of the NCAF member fellowship sites um, continue to recruit and or um, increase the number of positions they were bringing on um, instead of you know, completely canceling that out. Whereas the, non, uh, the fellowship sites that don't participate in um, the centralized application service, only 26% of those members recruited. So there was a very clear message from all of these fellowship sites um, that said, we appreciate young talent, we want to grow it, we want to have this pipeline, and we're going to continue to um, bring students on. I'll share a story. Um, one of our, there was a student who applied to both NCAF sites and non-NCAF sites, right? Um, ultimately, and got offers from both. Ultimately, the student accepted an offer um, at a non-NCAF site. And then once the pandemic hit, that offer was no longer valid and basically was like, sorry, we can't hire you anymore. Even though you signed an offer letter, we're rescinding this because we're eliminating the position. So then that student was, you know, oh, out of luck. They were like, I don't have a job. And I'm sure this happened to more than one student last year. So that student went back to that NCAF member site and said, hey, I know I turned down your offer. It, here is kind of what happened. If you're able to, I would love to you know, come on with your organization. And, and they had already filled their roles, but they made an exception for that student um, because of their commitment to fellowships and was like, you know, we'll, we'll figure it out. We're gonna bring you on anyway. Um, I, not everyone um, gets that lucky, but you know, that's just to show that all of these um, fellowship sites that participate um, really truly do care about your students and want to make sure that you know th they're offering a quality program and if it's a good fit for them they will bring that student on so that was just a little story I wanted to share um, but back to the numbers uh, in 2019 there were about over 300 fellowship sites and in 2020 there were over 100 so 
just a big decline in the number of sites that were even offering uh, fellowships, but even in positions, um, you know, last year there was only 200 or so. This year we're tracking to maybe go back to that 400 number um, because I've only heard of a couple saying they're not 100% sure yet, but the large majority um, are saying that they're going to be bringing fellowships on. So as we get more data around this, of course, all of our graduate programs will get this information as well. So, um, but it, it is a very competitive market. Um, so this is just the last three years um, of folks applying through NAFCAS. So um, I wouldn't have data for sites that don't use this, but for the sites that do, um, you know, over the years, the number of applicants themselves have gone up. We were around the 1,100 mark um, you know, 2016 to 2018. And then since then, it's definitely gone up. Last year, there were over 1,200 applicants and over 7,800 applications that came in. So that was about six applications a student. Um, and a lot of these applications came in during the last week. 63% of those came in during the last week. So um, one thing that we tell all of the graduate programs and all of our students uh, who, you know, reach out to us with questions is, Submit the application early because even if you're waiting on a letter or recommendation or a transcript, you can go ahead and submit and that will let the site see everything else except for the missing pieces. And some sites do consider those incomplete applications as well. I've had a lot of sites reach out and say, hey, this candidate's great, but their letter wasn't here. Can we just reach out to them directly and try to see if we can get this letter or figure out what happened and you know still interview this person? And of course, they are more than able to do that. So. We encourage students to apply early, but the, what we're seeing is that the large majority are applying during that last week. Um, and this is just for like for 2020, if we're looking at the tw uh, 1200 plus applicants, that's for 71 sites. So probably 150 positions or so. So that is a lot of um, applications that are coming in, a lot of applicants for the 150. So a lot of students are going unmatched. And one of the other things that we're doing is really figuring out um, how to bring in new fellowship sites. So whether that's you know through the traditional hospital and health system or through a non-traditional route at like insurance companies or consulting firms that have leadership development programs and um, also offer or some sort of fellowship program that they can take advantage of. So we're really trying to bring those in as well. Um, and then, um, you know, these are just numbers that we've got on our end. We do national benchmarking for graduate programs across the country. Um, and then Cami has started asking some questions for us as well. And one of the things we found was um, since uh, NAFCAS was started and the centralized application services there, there has been a 17% increase in the number of students who've now been applying to fellowships because there is an easy way to get that done. Um, so uh, just, the, you know, some interesting numbers uh, to look at. Um, I feel like I've done a lot of talking, so I'm going to stop and I'm going to pass it over to um, Juliet and Sue to talk about their university experiences um, with their students, with NCHL, with NCAF, um, any sort of recruitment things that may have come up and just other information that they might want to share with you. Thanks. I'll um, I'll go and just share a few minutes. So we joined um, NCAF uh, probably, I believe, about 27, 2016, 2017, just around the time um, that I started working at uh, in this position at Florida A&M. Um, at the time, we were not CAMI accredited, but we felt it was important to continue our membership because we were working on our CAMI accreditation. So we fully expected that we were going to get it, but we also wanted the students to be familiar with it. So that way, once we were in a position um, for students to actually apply to many of the programs that wanted CAMI accreditation, they would already be familiar with the process. So we started that and I'll be upfront and say it didn't quite work very well. We we didn't do a good job of really getting the word out to, to the students, to encouraging them to apply and to really create a critical mass of interest around um, both fellowships and then the NCAF process. So what we did this year that was um, different, but it paid off in, in dividends, is we held what we call the fellowship panel, where we had students, alums who had um, 
uh, gone on fellowships while soon after graduation. And they came back and they talked about the success of the fellowships. But most importantly, we invited Natasha to come and to speak to our students because we wanted them to hear fellowships are really important, but then we didn't want to drop the ball and say, now go out and find your own fellowship. We wanted them to hear it's important. Now here is um, a way to navigate the fellowship application market. And that, like I said, has really paid off. Whereas we've had maybe, well, since I've been here, we've had no students go on fellowships, but this year we've already had um, two acceptances and we have, um, so two students do have a site and we have, I believe about four or five students who are starting the process and we anticipate in the fall when the um, application um, process rolls around that we will have more students applying to fellowships as well because the word is out there. So having Natasha, having the, um, the alums come and, and really talk about fellowship was something that helped us tremendously. And this was a conversation that we opened up to our undergraduate students and not just the grad students, because we want the undergrad students, again, to start thinking about this process sooner rather than later. And then the last thing I'll mention is the professional development activities. That has been phenomenal. Every time I get an email, and I see that there's something directed for students, I immediately push it out to our students and I encourage them to apply. Or if there's, um, if there's a brief article or just some additional information that I think can help students as they develop and build their professional careers, I send it out to our students. And I know that the students are benefiting from all of that exposure to the healthcare management industry. And they're also benefiting from getting a better understand a standing of the process from going from being an academic sitting in the classroom into the workforce and into moving up the ladder in healthcare management. So it, it's really been working for us and I'm excited. And um, right now I'm actually off. I took off time off from work. I took off the week just to do some other things, have some personal time. But I have to say, I believe in this so much that when Natasha contacted me, I said, you know what, I'll take the hour. And I, I may not look exactly professional, but I'll, I'll, I'll take the time and, and sit here and talk to everyone because I really do believe in what um, this association is doing. I'll say a few words about our experience at the University of Missouri. Uh, so I had to look to see, we joined in 2015, I believe. Um, and uh, prior to us joining our experience with um, students going into fellowships, they, they went into fellowships, but it seemed to be uh, more challenging to, to track and know the direction, but becoming a member of NCAF, uh, we really, um, honed in on the process that uh, we do here at University of Missouri. Um, so we talk about fellowships with our students starting at orientation, and we even have a module in, in our Canvas and our learning management system where we um, track uh, where previous uh, graduates have gone on administrative fellowships. Um, in this coming year, uh, we have two of our graduates will be going into to fellowships. As you saw from Natasha, the numbers are, are lower with the opportunities for this year, but we're excited to have um, two students going into fellowships, one at an NCAF site and one is at a non-NCAF um, site in our region. Uh, what's been most beneficial for us with NCAF is the data, um, knowing what's going on with administrative fellowships. Um, and knowing about all the fellowship opportunities. I know that our, our students really appreciate going into um, the uh, NAFCAS system and, and seeing all of the great opportunities that are out there. Um, another thing that is beneficial is the code of good practice um, because before there was a code of good practice, um, there were many different practices, not all, um, maybe in the best interest of, of the students and in, in growing talent uh, in healthcare administration. So that code of good practice is an important part. Um, and another benefit is that it keeps um, my knowledge up to date and our faculty's knowledge up to date as we're advising students on the next uh, step in their careers. And finally, I'll just reiterate uh, the professional development opportunities are wonderful. And I 
uh, push those out to our, our students as soon as I see them in my inbox. I think you're muted. Natasha. I'm muted. Um, <laughs> you think I would know how to do it by now. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you. Um, thank you both for sharing your experiences. Um, does anyone have any questions for myself or for Sue or for Gillette? Um, we would love to help answer them and you know uh, provide that information. Just one quick unrelated. Um, you're going to be sending us copies of this? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I'll send you copies of the slides as well as the application link and um, a list of all of our members and sort of the benefits that come with being an NCAP member. That would be wonderful. Do you have any sense about how many fellowships um, are given out that's not part of your system? Yeah. Um, let me see. <laughs> So, oh, I see. I'm um, sorry, I missed it. Yeah, it, I, I mean, I, I have another deck on my, my personal deck that has the exact numbers, but um, so like between um, just last year, there were 201 positions that were offered. I see. NCAP and 208 that were not. That doesn't seem. I think that that may have gone up. I think there was a total of 56 positions that were offered outside of NCAP and 201 that were inside of NCAP. So I'll have to update that. But if we look at 2019, um, 175 were through the application service and 420 minus 175. I see. Yeah, a 245 outside. This was a uh, very... Uh challenging year this past year. Yes, it, it definitely was. And we're hoping that 2021, it seems like people have put the fellowships back in their budget. Some never cut it in the first place. So hopefully those numbers will go up and there's a little bit more opportunity there. It, it was uh, challenging with uh, with Cami when we were speaking about things like internships, people hired within 90 days of, of graduation. Uh, Juliet is uh, is smiling because she already uh, remembers this, and, and internships just kind of dried up. Uh, and, and obviously, we also had quite a number of people who either lost their position, you know, the the, the last in first out type of, of a phenomenon, and also there were quite a number of people. I I was quite surprised that, that went from full time to being part time people. So this, so this was um, a difficult year. Yeah. For sure. We did, when graduate start, programs started reaching out to me, letting me know, hey, internships are hard to find, um, we did uh, put together sort of a, a form uh, or, you know, peer-to-peer -peer collaboration form for our fellowship sites to really talk about what could be done. And we came up with a model, um, a couple of different sample models um, from what other sites were doing to offer summer internships virtually or like a hybrid program of some sort. So I think some people took that and decided we were gonna move forward with that. Some people said we still have to put the internships on pause, but it, I think it may have helped a little bit. Um, with internships, it's, it's hard because not all of the hospitals and health systems offer them. I wanna say only about 50% do. And then the 50% that don't, even the ones that do, they don't necessarily go through the same folks through the fellowship department. And so it's different departments and getting that information is always hard. And so I think, and I'm sure Julie, Gillette and Sue can add to this, there's probably other um, avenues of finding internships through alumni that they might be doing as well. Gillette, I'm sorry for mispronouncing your name. <laughs> Not a problem at all. <laughs> What some of the hospitals actually said was that they, they are only permitting people who were employees to come into the hospital. Mm -hmm. And that was one, mm -hmm. one, one thing that we heard uh, for the dissolution of internship programs during uh, the pandemic. Yeah, we, we experienced the same thing. And last summer, we ended up just doing um, approaching our internships similar to a capstone course where the students were doing case studies, but we did start to focus on virtual internships. 
And so that it, it's project-based and it, it allowed the students to still gain the experience. Now, of course, we know it's, it's just simply not the same as being on site, but it also did make life a little bit easier for our internship partners in that they no longer needed to worry about the students being in the facility. So, that worked. And so we, we decided to keep it going. So we have students on internship right now this semester. Well, they just finished the semester ended, but, um, but they did virtual internships and we anticipate we will keep virtual internships on the books as, as an option. Um, you know, if the facility wants it, it, it's there. But again, I mean, we all prefer students to be in the facility sure. and not sitting at home, you know, typing and doing a project, but it is. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I, we did interesting, we did an interesting, we did a series of survey, surveys last year. Um, and the first one we did focused around um, internships and what graduate programs were doing. Um, let me see, I'm gonna share this with you one second. So this was something that we shared with all of the NCAF graduate programs as fellowship sites. It was sort of a membership-based survey, but we asked about um, you know, what students were experiencing um, as well as if graduate requirements were adjusted and um, if they were, how were they adjusted? So other you know, collaboration, not with, the, with other graduate programs, so you can kind of see what others are doing as well and figure out if your program needed to make adjustments. But um, yeah, it looks like 67% of the graduate programs reported internships had been, you know, been canceled for at least one student or more. And 44% were using a virtual option for their students or providing a virtual option of some sort. And then 81% of our graduate programs were making adjustments to their requirements um, for, for, and this is just for the 2020 year or so, 2020, 2021 school year. So this year it might be a little bit different. We didn't resurvey our members on this again yet. So, but yeah. So it looks like we are almost at the top of the hour. Um, I did want to just share some important um, dates with you really quickly. Um, so um, the applicant portal will start June tenth. It would open up, up June tenth. So even if you're not um, an NCAF member by then, please let your students know that they're able to go on to NAFCAS and start applying for fellowships. Um, NCEGEL has been doing a series of informational educational opportunities. So on May 27th, we do have a coffee chat. I believe the topic is gonna be around allyship um, and diversity, equity, inclusion, um, but it's free for you know, anyone to, enter, uh, to, to join. So if your students are interested or if you or your faculty are interested, um, if you go onto our website, that'll have more information. And then we do host a human capital investment conference every year, November 15th to the 17th this year. Last year it was virtual. This year it's kind of up in the air if it's going to be virtual or in-person, but we are planning for an in-person event. So if you're interested in attending, I know a few graduate programs do come to that. So that might be uh, something you want to keep on your radar as well. But I'll send this deck out along with other resources so you have that and then you can always reference back. Good. Thank you. Yeah. I forgot to mute again. This mute unmute is still something, you know, it, you would sort of think after teaching this way for uh, over a year that I, I, I would be better at this. That's okay. Well, um, it is 1201. So I just want to thank everyone for attending. Um, thank you, Sue and Juliet, for sharing your experiences. We really appreciate it. And um, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to just let me know. I would be happy to help and I'll send all this information to you um, later today or tomorrow. Thank you very, very much. Okay. This was very helpful. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy your you. rest of your week off, Juliet. <laughs> yes, thank you for joining. Thanks for being here. Thank sure. you. Thanks. Bye.